welcome. This is DC Comics News Weekly Podcast, episode number 166. I'm never quite certain anymore if I get that number quite right, but I feel like I'm, I'm always close. So as long as Brad gives me like a yes nod or a no head shake, I'm usually okay. And then a, I can always just... That's a good just... sign. And we're getting up there a number. That kind of <laughs> I know. Coming up on 175 and 200. I wonder what Josh is going to have us do for 200, especially now that there's video. And Josh, you're a, you're a devious person, so I can only imagine what's coming our way. I'm your host, Seth Singleton. I am lucky enough to be joined today by the amazing Mr. Brad Felicki. You might know him from Felicki Fashions and all other walks of the world. Brad, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. <laughs> Are we in here in New York? How you doing? Not too bad. We got some sun. It was a little cool earlier, but uh, I think it might be toasty enough to go outside and enjoy the sunshine before the day ends really fast and you scurry back in. So <laughs> looking forward to uh, looking forward to trying to get a little bit of that as soon as we wrap up here. I think that's my uh, that's my reward after we finish recording today. Um, we've got some interesting news recently. Uh, last weekend, it surprised me. I didn't even realize it was the Super Bowl and all that stuff going on. Like, I, I laughed. I got a message from my mom. You're going to watch the game? And I'm like, yeah, it's next weekend, right? Oh, no. So I, I quickly recovered. And while trying to take care of a few things, I kept getting these notifications on my phone. And among them was the announcement that the Flash trailer came out. We finally got a peek at this movie that we've been talking about for so long that's supposed to tied together the DC multiverse, potentially, and do all manner of things. And after such a long wait, Brad, what did you think of finally getting a sneak peek at the uh, upcoming Flash movie? Oh, man, I, you know, I am really excited. Uh, you know, it's funny, you know, uh, Steve and I talked about this last week. And I said kind of the same thing. I was like, well, I went, oh, they released the poster. I wonder if they're going to, you know, release a trailer during the Super Bowl. And then after I recorded the podcast, I started looking it up to see if that was the case. And apparently it was pretty wide known knowledge that they were going to release the, the trailer. And I didn't even, I didn't even know. So that was, it was a, a nice surprise, but I sounded a little stupid on last week's podcast. But <laughs> yeah, that trailer, uh, man, it, it totally broke the internet. Um, and I, you know, it, it, I, I think they're doing a smart thing by focusing so much on um, Michael Keaton's Batman because that's such a huge part of the movie. But it's also kind of maybe takes a little bit of the spotlight away from the problems with uh, Ezra Miller, which is going to be all real life complications to this movie. But it looks good. The Supergirl footage was a lot better than I was expecting it to be. Um, I. Uh, man, I love the use of the Batman theme from '89. And at the end of it, that was that was great. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I love to to see Zod, which I wasn't expecting or knew anything about. So, yeah, I I, I can't wait. This this kind of already was the movie I was looking most forward to this year, despite the problems. Be just because I want to see what it means for the future of the DC. Ah, uh, film universe going forward. So, uh, man, I think that overall the trailer really delivered. And you being like our, our biggest Flash fan here, what would uh, what would you think of it? I'm really curious about your opinion. I think one of the great things about the trailer, and I, I loved it, so many of the things you brought up. I completely agree that the use of the theme song at the end was like just a really nice note and a great way to sort of leave that little earworm in people's memories if you remember that movie when it first came out if you remember the first time you saw it whatever your engagement was uh for most people who are fans of it that soundtrack that that melody from the soundtrack that is so synonymous right with back. what's that you said it took me right back right yeah and in that moment you you're connected to that and it's that lasting impression. Not only that, but you, you think about how much Superman 78 did for you know, DC as far as cinema. You then flash forward to the grittier, more modern take that sort of Batman 89 launched as far as we started seeing Flash TV show a few years later in the 90s. 
and then a few other projects gradually begin to spin out with this attention to a desire for more and an audience willing to, you know, really invest. You had the Batman the Animated Series, which was such a long-standing, well-loved series. So there was this growth that came out of those things, and so much of it was started by Superman 78, but was really, you know, I think the modern idea of it was kicked into high gear the possibility of it that it could keep going that superman 78 wasn't just a one-off like wow what a great fluke can you ever pull it off again sure enough we did it with another character and from that it was almost like there was a desire to take more risks and from that now we have that establishment of this cornerstone of the universe right so to have the flash movie come in with that i think is really important i think I think it does a really nice job, too, of setting up sort of the expectations and responsibilities of a character like The Flash. It seems really easy to see someone with superpowers who can traverse time like that. And you think to yourself, well, what do you just do all these things? And it shows the consequences of that. Much like I think so many people are like, oh, well, Superman's boring and this and that. It's like, hey, hey, if you have all this power, there's consequences that go with it. You have to understand those. And you have to balance those against what you want. There's what you want, and then there's what you need to be conscious and responsible of. And showing him taking that personal risk that somebody would to bring back somebody they loved. And the consequences of it, bringing in Zod. You know, I think it introduces a lot of those great elements. And I think what's going to be really fun is having these two berries next to each other. Sort of, I'm not saying that they're doing the same thing that we saw in the most recent Spider-Man movie. But it does give an opportunity for two characters who clearly understand each other very well, (laughs) being alternate versions of each other, who can, you know, sort of give each other almost that, instead of it being an internal dialogue, it's an external one. You have these two characters who are going to be addressing the differences in them and what they can learn from each other, much as I think the Spider-Man movie did a nice job of that, and allowing them to give each other the solutions that they can't really find on their own. Introducing Supergirl, brilliant idea. Thought it did a wonderful job. It, it it was a great tease at first because her identity was obscured enough that I thought, are they sticking? With, is it still going to be Supergirl? Or are we also going to see like a weakened, emaciated Superman as well? Could that be another teaser surprise, as has been done in some of the alternate universes, right? This idea of a, a Superman who's denied the, the sun and is a much weaker skinnier version of the the Superman we know. But the way it ended up giving that great reveal of Supergirl, the the use of her powers, uh, presence and demeanor. And then you drive it home with, we got Michael Keaton back. Like not only did you get the music, but you get the great actor. You get that, that wealth of experience. You know, this is somebody who's done a wonderful homage to his character through projects like Birdman, now bringing all that awareness into his portrayal of the character that was so definitive for him. And I think it's going to be a a really fun experience because I feel like those are all the teasers that we've gotten. I feel there has to be one or two big more reveals that come throughout the movie. So if that's what they're already setting us up for... I think we're in good hands. I think we can really see that thing that we're hoping for, which is a DC movie that can set up an understanding for all of the projects that are going to come and also how it is that James Gunn can take something that's already been in the works and make it fit into this new vision he has for the DC film universe and DC studios. So with that, um, I think there's a lot to enjoy from the trailer. I think it offers a lot. I think it suggests a lot. I think it also brings up a great point that you mentioned, which is not everybody's in love with the star right now. So having some directed attention to a beloved character who everyone's wanted up back on the screen for decades now does take a little bit of the edge off, right? You could sort of like, well, I don't know about him, but I like this. (laughs) Um, You know, we also have, of course, our perspectives but there there's also a little bit of information that goes along with the trailer we also got a synopsis that goes with it how do you feel about the breakdown regarding what it tells us about michael keaton's batman and also the fact that general zod's there i mean for i think longtime multiverse fans it was really quick to go oh well we know what's happening here he made a change and this is the end result and now we get to see the consequences but How did the synopsis do as far as setting it up for maybe new viewers who are not as familiar with the things we're coming
coming into it knowing. And the goal is to sort of uh, rope them in and get them interested in this idea right from the get go. You know, that's that's an interesting question, because uh, you use the, if you read the synopsis, it looks like Zahn is going to be kind of the big major villain in uh, in this movie, which is very interesting to see a character that's not in the Flash's bro gallery become the main villain. That's a very kind of brave choice, I think. Uh, and I think that does require a little bit of knowledge of people going into the movie to know a little bit more of the broader DC universe and the different characters. So I kind of like that they made that choice. And it does make sense that he changes time and realizes that Zod has come to take over the world without superhumans. So that's a really, that's, you know, that's a pretty perfect synopsis. I think that's going to be, uh, I think it's going to work great. Um, and uh, I think it's a nice twist on the Flashpoint storyline. Since we're not getting Thomas Wayne, I think that that's uh, that's a that's a good choice. So yeah, I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. And and it does make sense that Supergirl is going to be in it because it's not the I think they described it as not the Kryptonian that you were expecting. So there you go. I think it all makes a whole lot more sense now of what characters are in it and why. Uh, what about you? I completely agree. I also think that uh, to build on what you were saying, it 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 gives them the perfect transition they need, which is to move attention away from the fact that there's no more Henry Cavill and that iconic Superman role is is empty right now. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to introduce a character who's I thought, you know, was well introduced in a, a really fun movie for me in the original Supergirl movie and then not much carried on after that when I think it, it could have been done and I think it could have been really successful. But the fact that we're getting a chance to now come back to uh, a great member of the super family in Kara who has, uh, for me at least, I think when I've seen you know some of the more recent versions, has this very clear sense of identity. We were talking about the recent Tom King version, uh, Woman of Tomorrow, that has been such a great uh, you know, reminder for people of where this character has come from and, and what the great developments have been. And there's like a real strength, there's a real will there, there's a sense of purpose, there's an identity that isn't always uh, given the attention it deserves. I feel this project does a good job. I feel a couple of the other ones um, uh, I want to say uh, Mariko Tamaki did one and I feel a few others like really stepped into that character and gave her not only agency but also purpose and relationships and I think getting the chance to see those in the film version while hopefully this is a spinoff of that a brief introduction to it and also I think it's a really smart way to bring in someone with the powers of Superman at a much older time in their life, but also experiencing the world brand new, much like a child would. And the adjustment process, the, the ability for that to develop a need for friendships that are going to come out of it. So I feel like it's a it's it's a great moment for this story to occur. And if they build it correctly, we could have some really great super girl, super woman projects coming up in the future. Um, I think they also, I think the one thing they're going to need to really be clear about, though, is that for anyone who isn't as familiar, the first thing they're going to go is, Zod, he's died. I've seen it all over the internet. Like, Superman kills him, it's a big thing. People disagree over whether or not that's who he really is and representation of the character and defining moments and all this stuff. So getting them past that moment and to the idea of alternate reality, multiverse, yes, I also saw everything everywhere all at once, but not everyone's going to take that same translation over. Fans of the multiverse are going to get that, but I think that might be a sticking point. I hope that they do justice. Also, because Michael Shannon, man, the fact that we get him back on the screen, like it was, it was a great performance in Man of Steel, and it it was a shame that they had to kill off the character the way they did because I felt bringing him back as a recurring villain would have just you would have always guaranteed sales. Like he would just, you know, and what we've seen from Zod in the comics, like the potential for the character was, still is. And getting him to come back now in a multiverse version, maybe that could mean more Michael Shannon in the future. I don't know. But I think we're going to have to be really clear about that. I'm hopeful that it, it will be made clear. And 
beyond those points, I think the synopsis upon response from fans might get a few more details added in, a bit of revision to make sure people understand even more clearly before they go in. And I think we'll be in good shape after that. But uh, I think it's a good start. How about that? (laughs) Now, we've got the trailer. We've got the synopsis. But we also have the suggestion, something that um, I believe Steve might have been the first one to bring it into the conversation on one of our calls recently. The idea of the inclusion of another Flash from another universe, i.e. Mr. Grant Gustin from the TV show The Flash. Brad, you know I'm going to have some commentary on this, but I was curious what you think about it, too. I I like this idea, Um, even though it seems like the Arrowverse is kind of wrapping up as we go into this next phase of DC movies and television, but um, they have made a point that they're going to try to tie everything together through everything, through the comics, through the TV shows, through animation, through the films. So bringing him in in some way would kind of be a, a nice way to do that, but also leave the door open for some of those Arrowverse characters to return in some capacity down the line because they do have such a a uh, great fan following and uh, I thought Grant was great as the Flash in the TV show so I would love to see it you know we kind of got something similar with uh, the CW's uh, the Arrow versus um, Crisis on Infinite Earths with the different universes coming together um, I-, I think that would be a nice a-, a nice way to you know keep that whole idea of bringing things together in the DC universe that would be a really good first step. So I'm all for it. I mean, it's it's a, it's a rumor at this point, but I hope it turns out to be true. Uh, what about you? Of course, as with all rumors, you know, the question is how they will actually end up being either proved true or just, you know, left as a great idea that never happened. I do know that one of the things that we were talking about recently on one of the calls, it may have been Damien who brought it up was the idea that there will eventually be a shift from what has been to James Gunn's new uh, vision, right? And gradually everything will turn in that direction. With that idea, this does also seem like an interesting potential for maybe a handoff. We know that the Flash TV show is coming to an end. It would nice. It would be a nice sort of wink and a nod to Grant Gustin, but it could potentially be a way to bring in someone like Excess and and maybe show uh, maybe excess and also um, Kid Flash. This this like maybe they've got a future in the DC film universe in some way, and that bringing Grant in, introducing them, having Grant play whatever role he could play, and then leaving it to you know the children who are taking up the legacy. Because one of the fun things is at some point. In, in Barry's story, in the comics at least, he ends up, you know, somewhere in the 30-something century, and he and Iris live out their days there. You know, they become parents and grandparents, and with that, it would be a nice transition that would also have characters coming in to fill the place, or it would be an opportunity for a new character to come in and, and fill the boots, to say. Um, I do think that it would, as you pointed out, be a great way to recognize all the fans who've been so supportive of the CW shows, uh, who have made The Flash a show that's lasted into its ninth season now. Um, I honestly think, I think the the cast is the one who's mostly taking a break, you know, with the uh, the ending of the show. But I feel like fans could have watched for another 10 years, another nine, 10 years, easy. So giving them a nice little send off as well. Rumor as it is might be right now. uh, One of the things The Flash show did well was introduce and, and sustain hope. So I think a rumor like this might just do that for fans of uh, The Flash, of the show, and of the upcoming movie. You know, all the ways it can do the best uh, by all of them. When it comes to films, there's no shortage of surprises in the past seven days since uh, the last time. I think it was just uh, you and Steve who hopped on last time, right, Brad? And it was like right after that, suddenly we get the Flash trailer. Um, It was almost like they knew you guys were going to record. They waited to drop the news a day or two later. But then we also had some upcoming news about the Joker 2 project. Um, And we have a photo that reveals the uh, recent casting that will be included in and potentially a love interest and so much more. Uh, Brad, did, did this picture tell you a lot that 
maybe so far we've only gotten brief hints at from the, the descriptions of castings and other things? Or what did you take away from it? It didn't give away much, but one thing that struck me about the photograph is just um, how much love is coming from Harley in that picture. Um, we're Lady Gaga you know, playing Harley, but um, she's looking at him with a lot of love. And of course, you know, that goes sour, um, but that that's that's the thing that kind of stuck out to me. And, and that makes me think that she really embodied the character in uh, a really cool way and, and maybe different than than um, Margot Robbie did. But um, I don't know, there's something very telling about her character, I think, in the picture that that's what jumped out at me most, even more than um, seeing the Joker. Um, he seemed very similar to what before, so that didn't give away much. But yeah, there was just definitely something about the look in her eyes in that picture that, that stuck with me. What about you? I was really intrigued by it simply because um, I was curious how she would end up portraying the character and the casting, you know, I, I knew was going to be a, uh, what's the old phrase they call watershed sort of issue for a lot of folks. They're either going to love it, they're going to hate it. Um, and I wondered what kind of version of Harley we would see, you know, the, the picture, of course, being Lady Gaga up close with Joaquin Phoenix. And there's this very passionate and tense look on both of their faces. Hers much more so. His, he looks really saddened and downtrodden, kind of as we saw him at the beginning of the first movie. I wonder if the character's gone through a period where maybe he went on a bit of a spree, got arrested, now he's in something of a funk, or he's in almost like a uh, sleep cycle, just sort of waiting until he gets released. I, I'm always intrigued by the versions of Joker where... He almost seems sedentary while he's in Arkham at times, just waiting until something triggers him and then he gets manic again and then he, he becomes, you know, this dangerous, driven personality. Here he seems much more subdued and she seems to be suggesting the idea behind the uh, the title, right? This, this whole concept that it's a, a folly of two who share this same delusion, right? A shared delusion that is is something that i mean i appreciate anybody who can recognize when someone's troubled and connect with them and say i understand you but it looks like her understanding goes deeper than that and because of that we developed this um harley quinn persona from uh harleen quinzel and it's it looks like we're at that that moment maybe at the beginning of the transition where she's trying to let him know she understands who he is and and how important that is. And in the process, she's potentially the spark waking him back up again, causing all sorts of trouble. But I, I like a lot that it suggests great lighting there, you know, her in the shadows a little bit, the, the beam of light coming onto his face, him with this sort of sad and old clown mu uh, makeup, really nice details. Um, beyond that, it was hard for me to read much more. I can guess, I could speculate, but I, I felt overall it was just enough to make you go, it could be maybe, I think, followed by, yeah, but then I, I just don't know. So hopefully we will eventually know. Our final movie news story for you is the reveal that, as we mentioned, one of the great things DC does so well is hope, and I can hardly think of a project that reminds me of hope more than All-Star Superman and the recent announcement that this 2011 movie will be soon coming to release as a 4K edition. Brad, is this going on your shelf, buddy? Yeah, yeah, I think it will. Um, you know, there's one thing that we seem to talk about every episode this year so far. It's just that how great the animated movies are and how we like to keep them in our collection. And this is a, this is a great addition to all that, especially... You know, being in 4K now, I think that, yeah, I think I think a lot of people who work on the site are going to pick it up as well. I think definitely Steve and Damien are going to pick it up. Um, I, I think it's um, it's one of the classic Superman stories of all time. And the film was done really well. Um, it, so I think that it deserves the 4K treatment. So, yeah, I, I think that this will definitely go on my shelf. Uh, what about you? I can definitely see this one. I don't have a lot of physical movies anymore, just from so many different times of moving and things and the, the heartache of losing 
stuff like that or getting it damaged. Uh, but I've loved watching it on the HBO Max platform. And we know that some of the titles have been shifting around on platforms recently. So this might be one worth locking down. I don't know if I'd buy uh, like a physical disc, but if I can get a hold of a copy, I can download to a hard drive or something and buy that way. I could definitely see me doing that and knowing that I've got that safe and secure somewhere, maybe even with a cloud backup, um, would be a nice investment just because the the quality that I've seen on the HBO Max is pretty impressive, and it's a gorgeous movie. So why not, of course, get it in the clearest quality possible? I think that's one of the reasons why whenever they do a new uh, update on, like, Superman 78, people who love that movie and have physical versions, of, of course they're going to get the new version. It's a gorgeous movie already. Why not see it in the best quality possible? <laughs> I think the same goes true for this. <laughs> Uh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. So with that, that's our final movie news. We do have some TV and streaming, a little bit of comics coming your way as well. And leading off the TV and streaming news, the thing that had been speculated at, and now we've got the confirmation that Peacemaker Season 2 is on hold. Um, not a lot of surprise given some of the projects that we've talked about coming in the future. And also, you know, the need to sort of fit this show in as is neat and as makes sense best as far as that timeline is concerned. But, you know, uh, what were your thoughts on the announcement of this, Brad? Well, you know, uh, with the announcement of the new slate, I kind of expected it. I'm just glad that they didn't come out and say, oh, there's not going to be a season two. Uh, I think that the first season was good enough that we know that we have to have a season two. And I think um, Amanda Waller is an interesting character to have a whole series based off of her. Um, there's so much you could do with it. Um, she's so behind the scenes and pulling strings in in the DC universe. So I think that that that's a, that that's almost a good launching pad for some of these projects to have her kind of in the background. So um, I, I'm kind of interested to see what they do with the character and just how deep she goes with pulling like pulling the strings behind the scenes of the whole DC universe. And uh, you know, I don't expect it to have the humor, obviously, the Peacemaker did, but I, I, I think that this could be, a, it has the potential to be a cool, uh, cool series. And I think we're in a position now where things that are announced are more likely to happen than they were maybe even a few months ago. So I think that this is probably something that, you know, maybe I'll eat these words, but this is something that we can pretty much guarantee that we're going to see down the line. So that's, that's kind of good, too. Well, what about you? I agree with a lot of your points. It's really easy to to see how they can make these decisions. You know, it, with the way the Peacemaker series left off, it it makes perfect sense to follow through on the Waller storyline. I also don't think it would be that hard to come up with the Peacemaker season two. I'm sure James Gunn already had a vision in mind. He wrote up the first season fairly quickly. I think it was like eight ten weeks during the pandemic, and he had put together a script for the entire season. Uh, Maybe it was just a synopsis or a treatment, but still, he had everything mapped out. So I think considering what he had before, what can develop in the Waller series, and then knowing at some point during that where things are going, where you can then lift off and then pass the baton back to the Peacemaker seems like a smarter direction to go instead of trying to pre-plan a lot of things and then have to make all these changes in advance. So yeah, I think they're going to see how that direction continues, see how successful Waller does, but I feel there's always going to be a need for the Peacemaker to come back. It was one of the zanier projects. It gives to the DCU the same thing that Deadpool and other projects do. You know, the irreverence, the um, perception just to the side of our superheroes instead of head on. And therefore can sort of take a little bit of, uh, you know, there's some questions that never get answered. Or, you know, there's some ways that we revere and put on a pedestal and other characters are going to come along and go, yeah, about that. I have questions. I have <laughs> contradictions. So I, I think he's always going to come back around, like you said, knowing that it's on hold. Uh, it's a little easier to deal with now than back when there was so much more uncertainty and we were wondering just how things were going to shake out and uh, when we would get any sort of final news or even you know some update that things were actually happening, which is why I think there's also this feeling that a lot of trust is being held in the fact that James Gunn's already announced what his first project is going to be. Um, 
they're going to be doing the uh, Creature Commandos, which I think is also a really fun, irreverent, and zany way to look at the horror aspect of DCU. Um, our marvelous competitors have done an amazing job introducing some of their horror elements recently. I think this is a smart way for DC to take its own approach and then see what the response is like and, and what sort of characters can come out of this. What did you think about the announcement of Creature Commandos being the uh, first one underway at DC Studios? It's an interesting choice, but I think because it's it's a mix of animated, I think in live action they said this is the combo of both. So maybe it's something that they can get out a little quicker or something that, you know, Maybe, you know, we, we talked, I mean, oh gosh, who knows how long ago it was, where James, where, uh, James Gunn said, yeah, he had other DC projects lined up. And I'm kind of guessing, because this is coming out first, that this is one of the ones that he had pitched or had gotten accepted from a pitch. So I think that, um, I think that this had been in pre- uh, preparation for a little bit sooner than some of this other stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. And like you said, that it's a really cool way to introduce the horror side of DC Comics. So yeah, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm definitely looking forward forward to this one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm intrigued. I'm, I appreciate the reminder too that it's animated and live action mix. I, I totally forgot that. And then when you mentioned it, I was looking back over the notes and thinking that's going to be interesting because they're they're also pointing out that in the process one of the characters from this show will be arriving in the waller series so that would make sense i i don't know if the waller series would really entertain an animated character so if it's a live action character from that show who comes over to that would be a really interesting transition and i can see the sort of connective tissue going on there you know it's a really smart way to bring these characters from one universe into another, carry on the storyline. And I also feel like that might be um, a clue as to what the future might hold for Peacemaker 2. The idea of there being some element developed in Creature Commandos as well as Waller, and maybe even something else that Peacemaker can come along and, and do its own version of a story of and make it a lot of fun for viewers in the process. Instead of just trying to stick with what was ever the previous story and, and force it instead of working with it. And there's one more announcement coming our way about TV and streaming news, and that is the fact that we have four more actors who have been cast for the upcoming Penguin series, which I think is a really, um, (laughs) I think it's a project that's moving really fast. It's one that a lot of people are really interested in seeing how it plays out. Colin Farrell blew a lot of us away with his portrayal of the Penguin. Seeing what this character does Picking up, I think, as we've heard it described, a week after the events in the Batman took place and and sort of what somebody who can consolidate power, as we know he eventually does at times in the comics, can do and what these characters can play a role. What did you think about this announcement of the casting and the fact that this project is really picking up speed? Yeah, that's that's what stuck out to me is, uh, to be honest, I'm not really familiar with the actor's work, any of them really. I mean, I haven't watched some of the expanse and I do watch runaways. Um, but so uh, I can't really speak to the actors necessarily, but I really love the idea that this has seemed to be fast tracked and really trying to get this out there. Um, because this is one of those ones that I had doubts would see the light of day when it was announced. But I, th- I think that Colin Farrell's performance in the Batman was enough to say, Hey, we need to see more of this character. And I think that that was, um, a good choice. And I think that it looks like we're going to see this before we get to see uh, Batman part two. So, um, it, and I want to go back to that world, uh, that Matt Reeves created. So yeah, the quicker, the better. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. What about you? Definitely excited. Um, the one character I am the most familiar with is, and I hope I say this name correctly is, uh, Shore Agadashlu. She's from The Expanse, but she's also been in a number of other shows. Uh, I feel like my wife and I saw her recently in either the Jack Ryan show or um, something else. I know she's in the show they mentioned, Tehran, but I've seen her in a few projects. And she's one of those characters who has like a great command of the screen when they step on, like great presence, very slow, deliberate way of speaking, very regal. 
Um, so I think that could be a really intri- interesting introduction if she ends up playing like a major power player in uh, Gotham. I think that would be a great casting for a few of the others that I was looking over. Um, I recognize the names, but I didn't get a chance to do as much research, so I'll, I'll do my best to peek through them. I recommend, if you're not as familiar with uh, all of the castings that we've had, in addition, Renzi Felix, uh, Deidre O'Connell. Go ahead, look them up. You might find some connections because even with the shows that they're mentioning, like Michael Kelly from Jack Ryan, I'm pretty sure if I go and do a quick peek, I'm, I'm going to find some things where I'm like, ah, that's right. And I enjoy when these characters that I've seen recently in shows that occur somewhere else and I get the chance to enjoy them again, new character, new experience, and also remembering how much I've enjoyed their performance in the, in the past. So definitely got that feeling from this announcement. You know, I, I definitely recognize the caliber of the actors that I do know and the shows that the others come from, I know. Uh, that I've enjoyed the caliber of uh, story and acting there too. So I'm pretty confident, you know, based on just glancing at a couple. I mean, she, for one, just nailed it for me. <laughs> Great performance. Uh, I thought her role in The Expanse was really fun. Um, in the other shows I've seen her in, she's been phenomenal. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. With that, that's our last TV and streaming news, which means we get to go to the uh, source material. And I'm talking about our comics, those books that we love, those panels, those pages, those colors, those those dialogue bubbles. I don't know what it is about them, but they're so definitive. <laughs> with the uh, with the announcement that we've got the Flash movies tying together so many fun things in our multiverse, potentially, we also have the recognition that some branches of DC Comics have appeared to go off maybe in their own ways, but are now actually more intertwined than we believe they were originally. And one of those is the announcement that the Superman 78 series, which was inspired by the Christopher Reeve movie series and Batman 89 featuring Michael Keaton, which have seen spinoff series individually in comics, have now been revealed to be part of the same universe. Brad, what do you think about this announcement and all oh, the ways that uh, we're connecting the multiverse? Yeah, a very fun idea. I... I... I like connecting these things and I wonder if it's going to, you know, as I said before, talking about James Gunn, idea of everything being connected, how those two being in the same universe, how that's going to play out. Now, I think that that could lead to some really cool comic series, you know, uh, Superman 78, Batman 89 team up would be really cool. But I also wonder if somehow they can sneak that into into the films if we're still dealing with the multiverse situation. So I think it's a cool idea. Um, and I, you know, I think if I was a comic book writer, I'd be a lot of fun to play around with uh, because those are, you know, you, you mentioned earlier how iconic both of those, those were the, the films were and the, the actors who portrayed them was just, that's, that's been, that was so many people's ideal of the characters for so long that it's good that we can revisit them in, in any way. So, yeah, I, I, I hope that they do a team up comic at the very least. What about you? I think that would be a great idea. I can see a lot of people enjoying watching these two characters interact. I also think it's fun because if they, they keep that shared universe idea, you know, the characters that have spun out of it, very interesting version of Brainiac in the Superman 78 series, Batman 89, we had a new take on Robin We also had a very different um, Two-Face and a few other things that I think if we're allowed to carry on, we could see many other versions of classic characters we know and love as told through that that lens of that universe. So I don't know, but uh, what would a green arrow? What would other characters look like from that world? And, you know, you could almost cast it in sort of a more grounded, slightly more realistic where you have to a degree street level, but you also have those with the superpowers who appear to operate in a very specific way, or there's only a few, however you want to direct it. I think you have a lot of great source material there. And through it, it could be a whole new Elseworlds that you could tell versions of classic characters we know and love in in that place, right? (laughs) Um, I think also... There's been a lot of fun playing with the ideas of, you know, the 
what if it happened elseworld versions of events like say the suicide squad killing the justice league and getting a prequel comic um you know this is an idea that we've had talked about for a while because of the game now we've got this prequel comic coming our way um could we see other projects related to this, Brad? Like, is there a desire in the world for people to see the Justice League killed off by the Suicide Squad? And it's just a matter of how many iterations of media it's going to take? Or what was your overall response, buddy? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how much they're going to be able to get into the story. You know, as far as the buildup in the game itself, you might have to get into the gameplay right away. They might have like an intro cutscene, uh, but I don't know how deep it's going to be able to get because you're kind of under time constraints because a lot of game players, they don't like big, long cutscenes. So the idea of doing a prequel comic, I think, is a cool idea because I think you can set up that world pretty uh, pretty well with a prequel comic. Um, and it's called Suicide Squad Kills Arkham Asylum, I think is what it's called, and that sounds like an interesting interesting concept, too. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the game. I'm looking forward to the prequel comic. Uh, I, you know, I just wonder, games are so notorious for getting delayed. If the game gets delayed, I wonder if they're going to keep the schedule for the comic or if they're going to push the comic back too, because I think that still at this phase, that's still a possibility that could get delayed. So that'll be, that'd be interesting to see. And I think that they shouldn't push it back because I think that will help keep momentum for the game going and people excited about the game if they keep the comic book going so um yeah i, I think it's a i think it's a good idea and I'm, I'm curious to see more of this world i agree i'm interested as well i want to see how far they're going to take this world and the other thing i'm just going to throw out there is uh why not have it keep going whether the game gets delayed or not if there's one thing that we learned very quickly is if you tell one of these stories correctly, you could have the future Tom Taylor injustice idea right there at your fingertips. I mean, that's a comic that quickly took a game that's amazing, and most comic adaptations are not when it comes to games, but uh, Batman Fortnite proved just how good we can continue to do. Injustice, I think, set an amazing bar, and I think it's one where Kill the Justice League could potentially meet that. As long as it, you know, rises to the occasion, if that's what it wants to do. If it just wants to be fun and zany, I get it. Do your James Gunn, do your Suicide Squad, channel whatever versions of that craziness you need to. But I think there's some potential to be explored there. And there's some great history that we could reference and might really serve them well. So what we'll end up getting, I don't know. But I think you're right. The comic as well as the Kill Arkham comic. These are great potentials to see some amazing new creators and fun new versions of stories uh, why not explore it right why not? keeping that in mind we uh we also have the announcement that some newer characters are going to be joining the uh, dc universe and as they do we'll get a chance to follow the mystery along and see where it takes us one of them the vigil will be getting a uh title this is a new superhero team and they made some appearances recently in uh, lazarus planet next evolution so if you'd like to know more about them come may you can get your hands on this brad have you heard much about the vigil so far what's your interest in maybe picking up this new series now i i have stepped back from getting the comics as they come out a little bit uh, I'm, I'm step back and getting more into the trades and things like that. So I have to catch up on Lazarus Bennett, but the I, but the concept behind these this team, their shadowy team that has to stop technology before it gets out, you know, that's a very cool concept. And I like the idea that um, with this new dawn of DC, that they're also putting some focus on new characters because it's so easy to keep those iconic character, you know, focus on the iconic characters. But sometimes you need fresh blood. If you didn't have fresh blood, you never have a Harley Quinn. You never have a punchline. The list goes on. So I, I really love the idea that we're getting um, newer characters getting their own series. So yeah, I, I definitely be interested to check this out. What about you? I mean, the concept is pretty interesting. But the one thing that really gets me right away is Ram V. Um, 
Yeah. That, that pretty much yep. does it for me. Yep. Uh, his Swamp Thing, um, so many of his recent projects, it feels like it feels like you get that that wonderful blend of poetry and prose. Like he really captures that that sense, that nuance. Um, and I believe that what he's able to do with characters is actually a really strong thing for a new character and a new team like this. And I think the potential for someone that that talented also. Um, I don't want to say the name incorrectly, but it's I believe it's Lalit Kumar Sharma. Brilliant art. Uh, just the teasers that I've seen re- regarding like the caliber of the artist is kind of ridiculous, and and I like the idea of them shaping these uh, these characters and this team together. So I really like it's a really strong choice. And as you point out, we you know it's great to have a new dawn. It's great to have sort of a relaunch for characters we know and love, but new characters added as well who can make a significant significant difference. I mean, uh, Jessica Cruz and Simon Baz are perfect examples of characters who have made an amazing appearance. And another one that features in our next story, uh, Cass Kane, who uh, has really been a wonderful mainstay in the Bat universe, Bat family, as well as... Uh, Moving over to work with groups like Birds of Prey, we now have the announcement that uh, Cascane's Batgirl, Constantine, and a Spirit World title, um, bringing in a hero named Xanth, will also be joining the fold as we continue to get new characters and characters loved in series coming up. What did you think about this additional announcement of more yeah, titles coming our way? Yeah, this this title sounds cool, too. And anything with uh, Constantine, I, I, I'm down for Right. So, I had a feeling Steve's yeah. probably like ears so, are on fire right yeah. now. He doesn't know why. It, yeah, I'm for that. I'm all for that. And um, given how good Justice League Dark was, things like that, I, I like keeping that spirit alive going forward. And I like the idea that we got a new character mixing with some classic characters. So that that could be a lot of fun too. And everybody loves Gotham as it's a backdrop. So yeah, this is another one I think is going to be. Um, Going to be pretty interesting that I want to check out. What about you? Yeah, definitely something that interests me. I mean, as soon as I read in the in the brief things about the story that Xanthi's a character who scams Constantine, uh, I, I like anybody who scams a scammer. You know, anybody who cons a con man. That's a that's a pretty impressive, uh, <laughs> pretty impressive task. Um, Alyssa Wong, I've only seen a couple of glimpses of their work, so I'm not as familiar with, but just the glimpses of the image art that comes along with looks phenomenal. So I'm really excited for that, that cover that they, they tease for Spirit World looks really amazing. So I'm, I'm interested. And, uh, if they can, if they can match that with a great story with these new characters and this new sort of take as you pointed out, also introducing these darker corners as well as Justice League Dark did. We could really be in for a treat. And who knows? There could be a fan favorite series just right around the corner for us all to enjoy. Mm-hmm. Also, getting their own series is City Boy, who uh, <laughs> has an interesting power. One that reminds me of a character who is now, as part of uh, Wildstorm, is now part of the DC Universe. Brad, I'm wondering if you're making a similar connection when you read about City Boy at all. If not, I'm just curious what you think of this uh, new hero. Uh, you know, a little, but, you know, the thing that jumped out is you talked about his power. He could talk to cities. And to me, that sounds like something straight out of, uh, of like an Alan Moore or Neil Gaiman or Grant Morrison Vertigo title from the 90s. And that's, that's kind of my one of my favorite eras for that kind of stuff. So I, I, the character sounds very intriguing and I'd like to see stories that take me back to those kind of nineties vertigo titles. I would love it. And I think we have the potential with this. So I, this, this one I actually might pick up and not wait for the trade. I might pick up in stores because I'm so curious about how, how it's kind of executed. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to this. Oh, what about you? I am definitely looking. I'm I'm excited for this actually. Uh, so, the character I was referencing was uh, Wildstorm Stormwatch, and then he later went on to be a part of Authority, Jack Hawksmore. Oh, Do you yeah. remember yeah. that character? Yeah. And the concept was he was constantly being abducted by aliens and and modified. 
but the modifications led him to be able to communicate with any urban dwelling. So anytime he landed in a city, his feet could communicate with like whatever the pulse of the city was. He knew who everybody was, what they were doing, who the major players were. You know what I mean? It was like he could talk to the city. He could ask it like how things are going. So I like this idea of those same kind of powers being connected to City Boy. But in the back of my brain, there's also a part of me going, is City Boy connected to Jack Hawksmoor in any way possible? Well, is it just they say, didn't they say in the story that the, he made his debut in a Wildstorm title? So I think you're really onto something there. I think that that's really, I think that you, you might have nailed it. Okay, yeah. So he first appeared in the 30th anniversary Wildstorm one, which I can honestly say I'm realizing it was on my list and I did not scoop up. And now I'm going to go have to bug my LCS to get a copy of that because I, I wanted it. I, I realized I, oh, there's moments when you miss stuff, man. Get uh, yeah. well, do, comics, right? It's very easy because there's a whole lot of content out there in space. So, yeah. <laughs> totally but. agree. Okay. So, yeah, I, I definitely see an interesting connection to Hawksmoor. I want to see what that future can be like. I also love the idea of where we're meeting this kid, which is he's basically running around talking to cities and pawning objects they reveal. But I feel that that's just going to be the, the street level purpose that he has and then gradually he's going to be exposed to something much bigger because i mean think about it if if you have the ability that they describe here which is to communicate with the history of a city you know who all the major players are as far as crime you know the people who never get punished you you can really make an infer- influence you can really make a difference and then just for the final one uh variant covers by inyuk lee like I mean, I know it's probably going to be 50 to 80 bucks, but it's it's also like original art that's gorgeous on your wall. I mean, uh, between that, Michael Choi, um, it's going to be really hard. Oh, oh, yeah. And it's written by Greg Pak, by the way, <laughs> just as part yeah, of the, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, you know, the, yeah, he's the writing team. And then you've got Minky Young and uh, Sunny Go. I mean, I, I, it's kind of a dream combination. I also like the idea that with that, um, what sort of view of the city are we going to see? Could we perhaps start in one of those smaller neighborhoods that's defined by a culture that really, you know, has established their present for a long time? And then we go out from there into the rest of the city, because that would mean always coming back to a very interesting perspective. Or is it always going to be approaching from different parts? I think this series has huge potential. And yeah, I can see myself definitely picking up issue one. And in the meantime, like I said, I don't know about you guys, but if you find a copy of that uh, Wildstorm 30th anniversary special and you hear I'm having trouble, just tell me because I would really appreciate it. So with that, that's our final story of our 166th episode of the DC Comics News Weekly Podcast. I've been your host, Seth Singleton. It's been a pleasure to hang out with you. My uh, amazing co-host today, uh, Brad Felicki. He's always out there, whether it's Felicki Fashions or others. And if you love the wisdom he was dropping down for you today, well, he's got a lot more out there for you right now. He's going to let you all the ways that you can keep up with him and that wisdom. Yeah, you can uh, read my news and reviews at dccomicsnews.com uh, and uh, on this very podcast and on the Mad Love Harley Quinn podcast when we get back to that. Hopefully that'll be that'll be soon. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at uh, FlickyB1. That's F-I-L-I-C-K-Y and the number one. What about yourself? Where can people find you? So if you want to find some... Uh... I've been around for a little bit. So if you want to see some of my older reviews and stories for DC Comics News, you can go to DC Comics News, type my name in the search bar, and find any of my old stuff. Um, a little thing that the team here has known and I haven't really talked about because I'm always self-conscious about talking about stuff I'm working on. But if you want to see work that I'm doing, you can also see me writing comics for a character called Greedy Greg on a website called Hapsy.com. And... Um, if you like the stories, they actually just sent me the newest comp, oh, nice. which is their Hapsy Hodgepodge. And that's my character, Greedy oh, Greg there. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's about a 15 to 18 panel comic. I'm really grateful. The amazing uh, Afi Famrula does the art for us. Um, it's a lot of fun. Anyways, uh, it's been something that I feel Steve and Damien have sort of been like teasing at times, like, 
Damien the other week or two ago was like, you can tell he writes comics. And I'm like, okay, I might need to explain to people that uh, I've been doing a bit of, hey, thanks, man. (laughs) So if if that's something that interests you, if you have kids who like comics, if you're an adult who likes comics, go to hapsy.com, look up Greedy Greg. You can see the stuff I'm doing. And if you, you like stuff, get copies of the books. You don't like stuff, you need to tell me. Uh, hop on to Twitter, look for one more singleton. And I've got a link tree of all the ways you can get in touch with me, your stuff that I'm doing. And um, like I said, I'm still getting used to doing stuff like that. So that's about as far as I'm going to go with telling you about where you can find me and stuff I'm doing. <laughs> if you find me anywhere else doing anywhere, anything else, send me a message. Let me know. It'd be great to hear from you. Um, as far as DC Comics news goes, it's really easy to make sure you never miss out. We've got the YouTube channel. Just hit subscribe. We locate on so many different podcast platforms. Just type in DC Comics News and subscribe. Go on to your favorite social media platform. Use the at symbol. Capital D, capital C, capital C. OMICS, capital N, EWS, DC Comics News. You are set and from there, you can see all the stuff that we're posting about, newest reviews, newest episodes, and send us messages, send us comments, tell us what you're thinking, tell us what you like and what we don't like. We might listen to what you do say, and when it comes to the stuff that you don't like, maybe we'll listen, maybe we won't. I can't guarantee anything. What I can guarantee is every time you come back, we'll have great news stories from you. We're going to talk about them as much as we can. And if you subscribe to the podcast, you can keep up with some amazing things out there like the I Am The Night, Batman the Animated Series hosted by Steve J. Ray, our uh, Mad Love, Harley Quinn series covers the animated series up through almost the end of season two and uh, has a great time doing it. And more stuff is coming your way. So find us on the platform you enjoy the most. Subscribe. Never miss out. And we guarantee that as long as you're there listening, we're going to come back each week. New stories, great stuff for you. And we're going to leave you with one last reminder to carry you through until the next time. And that is to always read more comics. comics. (laughs) (laughs) You know, now that we can do the video, maybe we should do like a countdown thing. One, two, three. (laughs) It's a good idea. Who knows? Hey, we, we could really get there. Who knows? Hey, thanks, everyone. We appreciate you. Can't wait to join you next time. Brad, always a pleasure, buddy. Take care of yourself.